My name is Ashley Brown. I'm a client engagement manager here at Simmons Research. I'm really excited to have you all here today and talk with you more about the Simmons Crop Cross Platform Media Insights and the Cord Cutters Target. So that being said, let's go ahead and get started. In today's webinar, we're gonna take a deeper look into a growing and influential group that is changing the way we, can we consume content. This is the cord cutter. As this market continues to grow, we can expect an increase of streaming offerings and more fragmentations of video services. Traditional media companies like ABC, CBS, HBO, they're all starting their own streaming services and companies like Netflix, Hulu, and Amazon are pursuing more original content. With that being said, we can really only expect to see the amount of people quote unquote, cutting the cord continue to rise, which is why it's really important for us to take some time to understand them. So for this webinar, I've organized our insights into three different sections. We're gonna start with cord cutters, who are they? And we're gonna look at what they're doing and then the best ways to connect with them. So you might be wondering, what exactly makes somebody a cord cutter? For this webinar, we've defined cord cutters as those adults aged 18 plus who have no cable or satellite service subscriptions, but they do have broadband internet service in their home. So we know what makes somebody a cord cutter. The next step is to gain a better understanding of this group and to look at how they are demographically. People always perceive cord cutters as being younger, which is absolutely correct, but we also need to take a look at the group as a whole so we can fully understand who they are. Their age range, their majority of them are falling within 25 to 44 years old. This is gonna be the millennials and the Gen Xers. They have a medium age of around 36 years. They're fairly well-educated demographic with 32% of them having completed at least some college and 38% of them having completed grad college or more. They have a fairly high income level. They're reporting a median household income of around 66K and then 31% of them are reporting a combined household income of $100,000 or more annually. They're also very well employed. 69% of them hold a full or part-time job. Half of them are married, have children in the household, and are homeowners. And finally, we want to take a look at their gender, male and female. Male is skewing a little bit higher to be a cord cutter at 53%, with females coming in at around 47% being cord cutters. I thought it would be pretty interesting to dig a little deeper and look at the demographics and the differences, the generational differences within the cord cutter segment. It really comes as no surprise to any of us that 50% of cord cutters are gonna be millennials, age 21 to 39. Behind that, and as noted in the previous slide, we have the Gen Xers, age 40 to 54 years old, and that's gonna be about 25% of cord cutters. The attention these days is usually always on millennials, People tend to hyper-focus on millennials and what they're doing, but I really think it's worth noting here that 13% of cord cutters are gonna be baby boomers, those aged 55 to 69. I like to point that out because it's probably something a lot of people aren't expecting to see and definitely something to keep in mind as you're looking at this target. So how much is cord cutting risen? We decided to review this trend over the last two years. First, we're gonna slice it up by gender. You can see here that men spike among cord cutters. They've had the most rise in the last 10 years. But if we look at both men and women, you can see there's a pretty well, a pretty good overall shift from winter 2008 to winter 2017. Winter 2008, we started at just 3% and now we're up to over 8% in, over, in 2017. And currently we're projecting around 22 million adults that have been defined as cord cutters. This is something that's obviously going to grow and evolve and change as time goes on. So it will be really important to keep a look at future studies and see how this trend progresses. So we've looked at cord cutters by gender. Let's take a look at them by generation now. This tells us how, just how much each segment has grown over the past 10 years. Again, it's no surprise to us that younger generations have a higher likelihood to cut the cord, millennials leading the charge. Right behind them are gonna be the Gen Xers with another steady year over year growth. But again, I wanna point out the baby boomers. Though they haven't had a really high growth, they've definitely had a steady incline year over year. 
I think as more options of streaming become available, cord cutting and cord cutting becomes easier for people to adapt. We can expect a quicker and more rapid rise of this trend in the years ahead, and we'll possibly be seeing other generation groups latching onto this trend. So one last growth pattern we want to look at. We really cannot talk about cord cutters without looking at Hispanics. Hispanics, we have a large data set on them, and Hispanics in general have a higher likelihood to embrace technologies. We've broken this down to look at Hispanic cord cutters overall, first gen, second gen, and third gen Hispanic cord cutters. You can see in the past 10 years, Hispanic cord cutters overall have experienced a 110% growth rate. But it's really interesting to note that first generation Hispanics, those that were not born in the US, have experienced the most growth at 133% growth in cord cutting over the last 10 years. This is something you're probably wondering why that is, and it's definitely something to dive deeper into the why. Perhaps the expansion of Netflix and other streaming services into Latin America may really be shifting these viewers from their traditional media titans like Televisa and bringing them more towards the streaming options. So let's take a little bit more of an in-depth look at the Hispanic cord cutter. While 50% of all cord cutters are being identified as millennials, 13% of cord cutters are going to be Hispanics. Of those Hispanic cord cutters, you can see that millennial Hispanics are leading the charge with 54% of the Hispanic cord cutters falling within this age range. As is true with general cord cutters in general, the second most prominent generational group we're gonna have here are the Gen Xers, and then followed by the baby boomers. Let's also take a closer look at the language preference of Hispanic cord cutters. You can see there's almost an even split between English dominant Hispanic cord cutters versus Spanish dominant ones. Both of them are coming around about the mid 40 percentage wise. But let's also look at the 14% of Hispanic cord cutters that we're going to consider navigators. Navigators switching means switching from English to Spanish speaking equally. So we know their demographics. We've learned a little bit about the growth. We've learned about Hispanic cord cutters. Where do they live? Are they living in big cities? Are they living in small towns, maybe on the East Coast, maybe on the West Coast? Where exactly are they? A few years ago, the Wall Street Journal published an article it was called cord cutters avoid big cities. What it explained was that the larger urban areas are not experiencing cord cutting in the way that smaller and mid-market DMAs are. This isn't saying as a whole that cord cutting isn't happening in larger cities. It's just saying that it's having a much faster rate and it's catching on more quickly in smaller to medium-sized cities. So what we have here on this slide is a heat map. We created this map using our Simmons Local Consumer Insights. The map is really illustrating the point of the Wall Street Journal, Journal very well. It's showing us where cord cutters are most likely to live. The bigger and redder the orange circle is, the higher the index of cord cutters in that location. So as you can see, most of the areas with higher propensity are in the Midwest and on the West Coast and are located in smaller to mid-sized cities. In addition to creating this heat map, we also did a ranking from our Simmons Local Consumer Insights of the top 60 DMAs. We took the top 60 DMAs and ranked them on level of how many cord cutters they had in their market. It's no surprise that when we look at these, the top 10 markets with a higher propensity to have cord cutters are in places like the West Coast, the Midwest, and the Northwest. Smaller cities in places like Idaho, Utah, Colorado, California, and Texas are topping off this list. So perhaps one of the things most people wonder about the most is why are people cutting the cord in the first place? What made them decide to get rid of their cable subscription and not have one at all? There's some key data points we should stress here, and the first one is probably going to be what's at the top of your mind, which is money. People are cutting cable because it's cheaper not to have it. Yeah, that's absolutely going to play a role. But you can also see here that better programming, less commercials, the flexibility to watch what they want to watch, when they want to watch it, and the ability to binge watch are all other reasons that people are deciding to cut the cord with a pretty even spread across the board. This holds true for cord cutters, non-Hispanic cord cutters, and Hispanic cord cutters. 
So yeah, money is certainly a factor, but cord cutters are not necessarily only cutting the cord because of the cost associated with cable, which is what many people seem to think. They're also really concerned with the value of what they're getting in relation to what they're paying. So a good example of this would be, you might have a friend, they're paying for Netflix, they're paying for Hulu, and maybe two or three other streaming platforms. Well, that could all add up to around $60 for them, but they don't mind spending that money because in their eyes, what they're getting in return is better than what they were getting if they were paying for an actual cable subscription. This is things like playing things on demand, watching things with little to no commercials. They don't have to wait. They can pause, they can rewind, they can binge. They get instant gratification from this. So the perception of value is going to be a key thing to pay attention here. You get what you what they get for cable, or excuse me, what they get for what they pay is definitely a huge factor in making the switch from cable to no cable. So who's gonna follow suit in the trend? Who are gonna be the next people to cut the cord? We ask people if they intended to replace cable. If they indicated yes, then we follow that up with the question of when do you plan to cut your cable? You can see here by looking at this slide that there's a spike among ethnicities and race groups that intend to cut the cord in the immediate future. The immediate future being within the next month or the next two to six months. However, overall, you can see the spike and the majority of the people who responded plan to get rid of cable within the next year. There's a ton of buzz around cutting the cord. Is this really realistic? Are this many people going to follow suit? Is this something as further studies get released and we can have a more accurate conversion, a cord cutter conversion rate. So now we know who the cord cutters are. They definitely skew younger. That's not going to be a surprise to any of us. The age spectrum is wide and it covers all generations from millennials at the top, Gen Xers in the middle, and baby boomers at the bottom. They're very well educated, and a majority of them live in cities outside of the top 10 DMAs. You'll find them located in the West and Midwest in smaller to mid-sized cities. Hispanics are making up 13% of the cord cutters, and the biggest share of them are going to be Hispanic millennials, with over 54% of them falling in that group. Hispanic cord cutters are also, also evenly split among English and Spanish dominant, and about 15% of them switch back and forth between speaking English and Spanish. When it comes to reasons why people are cutting the cord, the pep perception of value is something to really keep in mind. Are they getting something in return for what they're paying? Definitely cost of cable is a huge factor, but it's not the only one like many people seem to think. And the high brown cord cutting, it's huge. Everyone's talking about it. It's changing the way things work now. It's a new market and it's a new target that we definitely need to look at. Most people are saying they're going to plan to cut the cord within the year. It'll be really interesting to see if this holds true. So now that we know who they are, we have a good picture of who the cord cutter is. Let's move on to our next section. We're going to take a deep dive in what the cord cutter is doing and their preferred mode of engagement. So you can see here that cord cutters are still consuming media. They're really consuming all sorts of media. Some things to point out here, TV shows, they're still watching the same popular TV shows that everybody else is watching. Saturday Night Live, The Walking Dead, Game of Thrones, Fixer Upper. They're also watching broadcast and cable networks. ABC, CBS, ESPN, CNN, HGTV. They're still having a nice, they're, their viewing habits are similar to that of a cable household still. It's just the way they're watching it is going to be different than people in a cable household. They also have a variety of magazine genres that are popular amongst them. And then of course, the websites that they're visiting. It should come as no surprise to any of us that Netflix and Hulu are gonna to top their list of websites that they're visiting most frequently. You can also see that Amazon and YouTube are top contenders as well. We have popular news reporting sites like the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Reddit, they're looking at the Weather Channel, and then using ESPN and Bleacher Report to keep up with sports. And it kind of goes without saying, because social media is king these days, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter are also going to top out their list of websites that they're visiting the most often. So it's safe to say what we've learned here is cord cutters are still enjoying all sorts of content. The way they're accessing is just different than how others are. 
So we know they're accessing content. We know what they're looking at. How are they doing this? 57% of cord cutter households own a streaming media device, while 42% of them do not. We asked people that indicated that they owned a streaming media device which device they owned. You can see here on the left that the smart TV is the most popular streaming media device to own, followed by the Roku and video game systems. But this narrative changes a little bit when we ask them which device they're actually using the most often, not necessarily which one they own. So you can look over here on the right. Roku is going to be the device that they're using to stream media the most often followed up by video game consoles. These are things like PlayStation and Xbox where you can stream content in addition to playing video games. And then behind that, we have four other ones that all kind of tie for usage. I'm sure you've heard of them. The Google Chromecast, Amazon Fire TV, and Apple TV, and then also smart app enabled DVD and Blu-ray players. So we can see they own devices, but the ones they use might be a little bit different. So what are they streaming on these devices? Well, that should be pretty, not a shock to anybody. Netflix, Amazon, and Hulu are gonna be your big three here. Netflix is really winning the market at about 52% of people streaming Netflix, with Amazon and Hulu tied for 23 and 22%. One thing I do wanna point out here that has a little bit stronger or less of a percentage is going to be website and apps for specific broadcast and cable networks. This is a trend I spoke about earlier in the intro and we'll be talking about a little bit more moving forward but it's something that's happening. When we're on here, we're looking at streaming apps that are gonna be used on mobile devices. That's gonna be tablets and mobile phones. It's really important to note, you can see the big three, Netflix, Amazon, and Hulu are winning here. But other apps, like I mentioned in the previous slide, the network specific ones are gaining some steam, NBC, CBS, and HBO. Also, it's really, announced almost monthly now, it's very common to hear of networks making their own streaming applications. Most recently and probably top of mind for everybody is Apple and Disney just announced they're going to be starting their own streaming services. They're following in the footsteps of networks like HBO, Showtime, CBS and NBC, Bravo, MTV, A&E, The History Channel, all these people have their own streaming apps that has some of their specific streaming data, streaming programs only on those applications. So we need to keep an eye on this. Are Amazon, Netflix, and Hulu going to be able to keep their market share as the top three as time goes on and more things get introduced to the market? Or are we going to see a lot more fragmentation as more streaming services are introduced? So we have the big three, Netflix, Amazon, and Hulu. Where are these things being watched? We can provide a measurement for smartphones, tablets, and websites. So if we start over here at Netflix, Netflix averages, the, or Netflix preferred mode of viewership is going to look like it's the website with 230 average minutes per month spent streaming on the Netflix website. In turn, we can look at Hulu. It looks like the tablet wins out for Hulu with 234 minutes of streaming per month on the Hulu tablet application. And then looking at Amazon, the tablet wins out as well. 202 minutes per month streaming on the tablet for Amazon. You're probably looking at this and thinking, why doesn't Amazon have a website measurement? That's because there is no subdomain for Amazon video. So people can be going to amazon.com to shop. They can also be going to amazon.com to view video. Because there is no subdomain, we cannot tell the difference between people at amazon.com shopping and amazon.com streaming video. So we do not provide a measurement for that. So we know what cord cutters are doing now. They like the content that TV has to offer. They like the same shows, the same channels, and they mirror the same watching patterns as those who are what have cable. Cord cutters like to have control and options though, and the way they're viewing this content is different than those in cable households. Many cord cutters own a smart TV, but the primary device to stream content is gonna be a Roku followed by video game consoles. We're also seeing people use stuff like Chromecast, Apple TV, and Amazon Fire Stick as well. 
It's no shocker, our top three, Amazon, Netflix, and Hulu, are the dominant players in this field. They have been for a while, and their original content is really helping them gain subscribers on a daily basis. But we are seeing fragmentation of these applications because people are starting to use network and broadcast channel specific applications like HBO and Showtime. Those are gaining steam, and we'll definitely need to keep an eye out on how this affects the market share moving forward. We're able to track smartphone, tablet, and desktop activity. And this data points out that no device reigns supreme for streaming. Some services skew higher for desktop web website streaming, while other index higher for tablet usage. So now that we know who the cord cutter is and what they're doing, it's time for us to go into our final section. We're gonna switch gears a little bit and we're gonna look at how cord cutters think. We're gonna take a deep dive into their hyperactive and multitasking world. We're gonna to try to understand what they value and how to reach them, how they spend their time, and the best ways to find them. So we'll start out by looking at how cord cutters behavior differs from households with traditional paid programming. The first thing I wanna point out here is the first line. My tablet is my primary entertainment device. Cord cutters are 19% more likely to agree with this statement than somebody with a cable subscription. Also down the second to last, the bottom, I prefer streaming on my computer or mobile device more than my TV. A cord cutter is 43% more likely to agree with this statement than a person with a cable subscription. So what we see here is their tablet is important to them. Their computer is important to them. They like digital devices that they can use on the go. Down at the bottom, we have, I don't mind ads when streaming if the content is free. Cord cutters are 13% more likely to agree with that statement than somebody in a cable household. I like to point this out because this goes along with a the theme we spoke about in the first section that cord cutters are all about value. They want to get something in return for what they're giving. So in this case, they're giving their time to watch an advertisement, but they're getting free streaming content back. So what are they doing online? We can see here that cord cutters really enjoy talking about the content they're consuming. I use the internet to search for information, gossip, or trivia about something I saw on TV. I use an app that provides additional content and extras about a show I enjoy. I start conversations on social networking sites, blogs, or other sites about TV shows and movies that I have watched or heard about. And I post, tweet, comment or participate in online forums about a TV show that I am watching at the same time I am watching the show. These four statements cord cutters are over indexing really high for, especially I use the internet to search for information, gossip or trivia about something I saw on TV. Clearly they're really, they're paying attention to what they're watching and they want to talk about it with others. Which brings me here to social media and website visitations. We've just established cord cutters are super active. They love social media, they're spending time on it, and they're spending time on it talking about what they're watching. They're accessing the data quite a bit and racking up many minutes a month on these platforms. You can see Twitter, they're spending an average of 179 minutes a month on Twitter, 212 minutes a month on YouTube, 199 minutes a month on Instagram, and 189 minutes a month on Snapchat. They're accessing Twitter 48 times a month, 47 times a month for YouTube, 51 times a month for Instagram, and around 48 times a month for Snapchat. Over here on the left, which we have first is Facebook. Facebook is king here. People are averaging around 384 minutes a month on Facebook. That's a ton of time. And they're accessing this application a minimum of like 82 times on their smartphones. They're spending a ton of time online. They're always engaging with others. They're very connected to the outside world. So as I noted in the last slide, cord cutters are very engaged in the television content. They're on the social media sites all the time. Just take a minute to probably think back to this last Sunday. I don't watch Game of Thrones, but I'm sure many of you do. I feel like I watch Game of Thrones because if I get on Facebook anytime during Game of Thrones, it's all that's happening on my feed, same on Twitter. I feel like I know a lot about these characters and I've never even watched a single episode. 
The same could be said for shows like The Bachelor and Bachelorette. You see Twitter and Facebook blowing up about that stuff on Monday night. People always have something to say. Football games, award shows. If you're trying to watch something and you can't catch it on the original viewing, chances are you're going to avoid social media because it might get spoiled for you. So again, they're actively sharing their thoughts about programming on social networks. They're also taking the time to read what others recommend. And they're also looking at peer review and blogs, and they're using entertainment specific applications like IMD and Rotten Tomatoes to help them enjoy the content more, but also find other things to watch. So I took a look at cord cutters and some trends of theirs over the last five years, specifically looking at media devices that they use, how they pay for content, just how they're consuming things. And a few things stood out that I wanted to share with you. First, it's going to be the tablet, which we have talked about a few times. They love their tablet. Five years ago, if you had asked them, were tablets their primary source of entertainment? Chances are they would agree, but not as strongly. Over the last five years, it's really grown a significant amount. The fact that cord cutters find tablet as a medium is their primary source of entertainment. Also, we have a note on eBooks. Cord cutters are becoming increasingly more aware over the last five years of the importance of paying for authors for their work and being willing to pay for ebooks. They might have started out not understanding the value in that, but they're getting the value now and they're willing to pay for these ebooks. But on the reverse of that, the use of torrent sites has also really gone through the roof. It's increased a lot, and this is presumably for music and video content that they're unwilling to pay for. They probably aren't finding the value in paying money for music or these videos, so they're going to torrent sites for them. And then I'm sure everyone's thinking, well, do cord cutters even watch TV anymore? They don't have cable. I mean, how are they? Yes, they're absolutely watching TV. Five years ago, television was a medium that cord cutters really didn't see themselves living without. But over the past five years, the ability to download and watch video content online has really changed this thinking for them. The fact that they don't really super agree with television is a medium they can't live without. They're still watching TV, but they're not as attached to it as they used to be. So a lot of you might be wondering, well, what do cord cutters do if they're not watching TV? How are they learning the news? How are they staying entertained? You can look here on the left, and it's really clear that cord cutters are not relying on traditional television to keep them informed or entertained. In fact, they're under indexing quite significantly to agreeing with these two statements. If you look here in the middle, I rely on radio to keep me informed. Cord cutters are over indexing for agreeing with this. So they're looking to the radio to keep them informed. Well, how do they stay entertained? It looks like radio, magazines, and video games. So instead of turning to TV for their main information and entertainment, they're looking at alternative sources like the radio, like magazines, and like video games. What can't they live without? A lot of people have certain opinions on what they can and can't live without. And when you look at the cord cutter, they're indexing really high for digital devices and they're much lower for television and traditional media. What this means is cord cutters are more attached to their digital devices. They're less attached to their traditional devices or mediums like television and newspaper. For example, if you look up here at the top, a cord cutter is 65% more likely to agree with the statement that they can't live without their tablet than an average internet user. But we also put that up against people who have cable. Cord cutters are 90% more likely to not be able to live without their tablet than the person in a cable household. This also holds true with cell phones and smartphones as well. They're strongly attached to their digital devices. So how are they behaving when they're watching the TV? Are they fully engaged? Maybe they're just kind of watching the TV and playing games on their phone or talking to somebody, or maybe not at all. Cord cutters are super, super multitaskers. They're more likely to multitask than a person in a regular cable household. And in fact, 80% of cord cutters agree with this statement. When I am watching TV, I am usually involved in other activities. 
So as you can see here, they index really high for being on computers, looking at websites, chatting, doing videos, and texting, emailing, and talking on their phone. Their attention is focused on many screens. They're doing multiple things at once, and they always have a lot going on. So we just established this group suffers from hyperactivity. They always have a lot going on, and devices are competing for attention at all times. Information overload is the norm. That's illustrated pretty accurately here in this reach graph that we have from the last 30 days. Mobile phones, PC at home, tablet, radio, TV, and streaming media are all things that they're looking at pretty significantly. Keep this in mind when you're planning a reach campaign because a multi-screen effort should definitely be implemented. You need to have a consistent campaign across mobile, computer, tablet, and traditional media vehicles to help drive home a message to your cord-cutting audience. So we've talked a lot about their multitasking and the fact that they're hyperactive. How do you effectively reach a target that is notorious for having a really short attention span, having a lot going on, and being multi-screen centric? A solution to this is to build out an effective media plan. This requires the right blend of mobile, tablet, streaming media, and digital and internet advertising. By doing this, you can gain almost 100% of your audience's attention. You can do this in areas where the audience is leaning in rather than leaning back. So I'm just gonna do a little bit of a visual representation here of an incremental reach. If we start with streaming media as the only device that we decide to reach the audience on, we could potentially reach about 69% of the cord cutter audience. Well, we're not at 100, so let's add a little more. We'll look into adding tablet as another medium to reach them. That adds 11% of unduplicated reach. So that brings us to potentially reaching 80% of our cord cutter audience. Add PC at home, that adds 14% to the undu of unduplicated reach. And now we have a potential to reach 94% of the audience. And then finally, we still have some people left to reach. So let's add the mobile phone, which brings us to 99% potential reach. So as you can see, by doing streaming media, tablet, PC at home, and mobile phone, you could potentially reach almost 100% of your audience using just these four digital vehicles. When do we reach them? What time of day is best? The morning, maybe the evening, lunchtime, all hours of the day. When's the best time to reach your cord cutter audience? What we have here is a mobile day in the life profile of cord cutters. It's looking at their streaming of video on their mobile devices. This graph portrays weekdays only, and we've put up a comparison with people in cable and satellite households as well, as well. That's in dark blue, cord cutters are in light blue. So when you take a look at this, you can see that digital and streaming video, it follows the same path as traditional television prime time the largest percentage of viewing is happening between the hours of 6 and 10 p.m. Well, the largest percentage of viewing for cable and satellite viewers is also happening between 6 to 10 p.m. So what we can see is the way cord cutters are consuming this content is yes, it's very different from the way a cable and satellite household is, but we're not seeing a huge shift in the time that they're viewing this content. Definitely something to note and keep in mind when you're planning your multi-channel reach campaigns for cord cutters. So I know that was a ton of information. Hopefully you guys have learned a little bit. I'm gonna take a minute to recap everything we've gone over here. Cord cutting has clearly accelerated over the last 10 years. Our biggest shift has been in the last four to five years. This is happening across multiple generational segments. No surprise, millennials are leading the charge. We have Gen Xers in there and even some baby boomers. One thing to note is Gen Z is kind of young right now, but as they get older, they're definitely going to have an effect on the industry as a whole. Tech-savvy Hispanics are driving the cord cutter segment among millennials, and big cities are not losing customers to cord cutters as rapidly as smaller mid-sized cities. That's happening mostly in the medium-sized DMAs. It's really evident that cord cutting is not being driven solely based on the cost of cable and the expenses that are associated with cable. Cord cutters are looking for choice. It's about value and it's about freedom. 
they want to watch what they want to watch when they want to watch it. And they want to feel like they're getting something good in return for the money that they're spending on their entertainment. Is cord cutting going to grow even larger in the future? We're really not sure yet. We obviously know it's going to grow in size. More people will be adding on as the time goes by, but we just simply don't know by how much. We know people are discussing in their households of getting rid of cable within the next six months to a year, but is that going to hold true? Is it going to be harder for them to actually give it up when they get to that point? Are they going to be able to adapt to the cord cutting technology? This is something that we definitely need to keep an eye on as time progresses. And smart TVs are the main streaming device owned amongst cord cutters, but they're really using Roku and video game consoles to most to actually stream the content on their TV sets. They're also using things like Google, Chromecast, Apple TV, Amazon Fire Stick, and smart enabled DVD Blu-ray players. And cord cutters aren't anti-advertisement. Yes, they really don't care for it, but they do not mind if they're getting something for it. If you're giving them free content to stream in exchange for a few advertisements, chances are they're going to be okay with that. There's a value proposition that content providers really need to keep in mind. And cord cutters want to discuss the shows they watch and they're active on social media. Like I said, I'm sure we can all recall in, in like anything that was on TV or in the movies that we saw talked about on social media even just yesterday. They're online, they're expressing their opinions and they're sharing their experiences about the show. They're seeking out special entertainment apps like IMDb and Rotten Tomatoes to talk more about these things and also to find more content to be engaged with. And most importantly, what we've really learned here today is cord cutters are not unreachable. They're in fact very much reachable. It just takes a bit of a juggling act. They're hyper multitaskers. They have a lot of things going on at once. They're always looking at multiple screens and their attention is just kind of all over the place. So you are competing for the attention. But you just need to figure out the right frequency and incremental reach will be possible. The main key is to diversify among screens with a traditional media mix. So that concludes my portion of the presentation today. I really hope that you found this case study insightful and you can see how the Simmons cross-platform media insights can provide a ton of information on digital behaviors for cord cutters, but not just cord cutters, really any target that you're looking to learn more about. So again, thank you so much for attending and your time and attention during this webinar. I'm gonna hand it over to Allison now for any questions that might've come up during the presentation. Thanks, Ashley, and great job there. Um, if you have any questions at this time that you haven't entered in yet, please feel free to use your question feature in your GoToWebinar. Um, and I'll get us started with a few that we already got. So my first question, Ashley, um, for you is, did you find that cord cutters prefer one social media vehicle over the others? Um, when we ran the data, we definitely did find that cord cutters are really no different than anyone else when it comes to social media. Obviously, we all know most people, especially among the groups we're looking at today, millennials and Gen Xers, they really love social media. They do log in a quite, quite a bit, but no social vehicle preference stood out more than the others. Facebook is obviously being used the most, but Instagram, Twitter, and Snapchat are also still really huge. All right. Um, the next one we have is, what can you tell us about their advertising preferences um, in terms of cord cutters? Well, cord cutters do not view traditional advertising as helpful or engaging. They don't necessarily hate it. They just kind of don't want to be bothered with it. So advertisers should definitely consider some integrated campaigns that feel more natural and a little bit closer to real life. Another thing to note is the value proposition. If they're sitting, like maybe give them in something in return, like free content, et cetera. They also, and there's, oh, sorry, that's it. <laughs> All right. Um, another question. Uh, how do you define millennials? So we update our age brackets yearly to make sure to reflect that they have aged. For this webinar, we use ages 21 to 39, which was based on um, the Pew Research data that we use as our benchmark. Um, next question. 
Is there any data about the family gathering together to watch their shows? That's actually a good question. We've had a lot of questions about that in the past. At the moment, there is not, but we have discussed internally adding a question into our media behavior trend study that reflects this. I'm not positive if it has been added, so we'll need to have somebody check on that and get back with you later to let you know if that question is in the field. Okay. Um, what time metric can you report on? Okay, so what time metrics? That really depends on the data point that we're looking at. So if we're looking specifically at activity on a device, we can report the last day, which was the previous day, the last seven days, and the last 30 days. Uh, if you're looking at specific device application usage, we report on the last seven days and the last 30 days. Um, next question, uh, what is cross-platform media insights and is it a project, is it a tool, what, what is it generally? Okay, so cross-platform media insights, it's our media planning and profile solution. You're probably wondering what that is because it is a new name for our old, our product that is formerly known as Simmons Connect. That's probably what you're familiar with. So if there's some confusion there, that would be why. It's a digital panel built off of our NHCS sample, and it really helps you at measuring things like reach, day in the life digital activities. You can look at time spent, the incremental reach report that I showed there at the end. It just shows a lot of digital uses measurements. Okay. Um, and uh, you referenced a slide with a map. Um, do you guys, how many DMAs can come in that or list of? Okay, so that slide was covering where cord cutters live. It was a heat map that we created out of our Simmons local, and it was showing you where cord cutters were living and where they had the higher propensity. We can, we also ran a report of the top 60 DMAs and where the people, where the DMAs rank within those as being cord cutter cities. We can definitely provide you with that list of those DMAs separately after this. Um, and uh, next question is, you referenced a few different generations of Hispanics. Um, how are each of those generations defined? Okay, so we were looking at Hispanics that were either first generation, second generation, or third generation. First generation Hispanics are going to be defined as the respondent was not born in the United States. Second generation Hispanics, where the respondent was born in the United States, but their parents were not. And then the third generation is going to be Hispanic respondents who them, their parents, them and their parents were all born here in the United States. 